What is up, Agent Hits? So sorry for the horrible video quality, but you won't be seeing a lot of me today anyway, because today we're doing a interview with the CEO of AlphaDan. This is going to be the follow-up video to our very popular AlphaDan video, the video on the revolutionary inline four-cylinder AlphaDan engine. Now that video was really popular and it did receive more than a million views in around five days. Some people really liked the concept, really liked the idea, others were skeptical, but most of all there was a lot of questions. So what I did is that I went through the comments section out that video and boiled it down to let's say a couple of key questions and today we're going to ask these key questions to the CEO of Alpha Dan, Mr. Albert Araujo. So without any further ado, Mr. Araujo, thank you very much for joining us today and thank you for responding to my call. Well, glad to be here and finally be able to put a face behind the, uh, the person and the emails. So I'm going to start with the questions right away and our first question is, so is there a story behind this engine? How did you come up uh, with the Alpha Dan in line four cylinder. Okay, the the story actually starts back in 1995, and I'm going to bring you know with the minute the first miniature gas turbine that that we designed and built and brought to market, and I I'm not going to get into all the details because we'd we'd be here for hours talking about it, but the same process that that we used back then is the same process that we use today, with the exception of 25 years of accumulated knowledge on you know what to do and what not to do. Um, in 2013, a company here in South Florida introduced the, the very first high-performance outboard engine uh, to the marine industry, and that created a complete um, new industry and a paradigm shift in the industry, where now boat builders had more horsepower, and they were able to take their normal-sized boats from around 25 to 35 feet up to 45, 55, 65, and some companies even have boats in the 70 and 75 foot category now. And this particularly applies to center consoles and, and luxury boats, okay? So I followed the seven marine designer, that, that first engine that came out, and I found it to be an extremely complex design, and uh, it was big, it was heavy, so it kind of defeated the purpose of going to the you know, the higher performance outboard because you weren't really gaining much in the way of, of uh, weight reduction or anything like that. So that kind of got me going into, you know, there's got to be a better way. How can we come about it? I then was fortunate enough to uh, find through the internet an engine called the Borg 400. Uh, the Borg 400 was designed by, the original Borg was by Russell Borg back in the 1920s. And the Borg 400 was the first 400 cubic inch it was a four-cylinder, horizontally opposed engine uh, that was designed in the, in the 1940s, mid-1940s. It's the only one of its kind, and I, I was able to purchase that engine and, you know, basically uh, overhaul that engine and uh, restore it. And in the process, I learned, you know, about the, you know, the, the rod that was in that engine, which created a sinusoidal uh, movement of the pistons. Well, my first instinct was, how can we use this engine? Because at that point, at that time, not today, but at that time, I thought that the design was, was, was really good. So we figured, is there a way to use this to create this high performance outboard that meets our criteria? And the, the answer was no. The horizontally opposed uh, design resulted in an extremely large and an extremely heavy engine, which would have been, you, well, you would have been better off just getting a big block V8 and turning it on end and, and using that. So I went off on a quest to find what I would consider to be the perfect power plant for this project. And what we're looking for in an outboard is not to build an engine that's, a, you know, that's, that's gargantuan in size. We're looking to build an engine that's relatively small, relatively lightweight. You want to try and have an, an engine that underneath the cowling, you can keep it within 22 inches. So you can mount the engines at 26 inches on center, which is kind of the holy grail of where you want to be, okay? So I looked at engines that dated back to the 1920s. I looked at every engine up to the engines that we have in our, in our cars today. And I looked at a lot of the concept engines for the future. And what I found with almost all the concept engines that are out there is that they've got problems from an engineering perspective when it comes to sealing the combustion chamber and lubrication, okay? Uh, take the rotary wankle or any design that is a, a derivative of the rotary wankle. You've got the issues with the, with the tip seals. You've got the corners of the, of the seals. Um, that have proven over time to be a problem. So at the end of the day, the one thing that I think n nobody out there will, will argue with me on is there's no better way to seal a cylinder than putting a round piston in a round hole with round rings that you can maintain extremely tight tolerances and, and accomplish what you want. You don't see a hydraulic cylinder out there that's got a square design. They're all round, okay? So 
the one thing that, that came up over and over again in my research was the inline four as being, you know, an engine that obviously had half as many moving parts as a V8. The design of the block was short. The crankshaft was short. Everything about the engine was exactly what we were looking for. But it suffered from the secondary imbalance, which you did a really, really good job of explaining in your video. So from, you know, when I look at things from an engineering perspective, I always say to myself, where is the problem? Let me get rid of the problem and let's find a new solution, a new way of doing that, okay? So if you go back, for example, you talk about balance shafts, every single patent, every single design that is out there to fix that secondary imbalance condition is a band-aid. It's not a solution to the problem. And as you explained, as the displacement increases, the engines fail. So at that moment, the Bork engine was kind of the aha moment. You know, if we could build a connecting rod that, that does what the Scotch yoke does, then we've got the answer to what we're looking for. And that pretty much is what got us on the path where we are today. Okay, great. So that brings us to the big question that I think most people want to know about, and that is the patent issue. In the comment section, a lot of people have actually commented by pasting this patent, and it is US1037857A-B1. Now, when I, when I, I remember when I first spoke to you on the phone, uh, you told me that this patent isn't it. So if this patent isn't it, what, what's this patent about? And if that patent isn't it, then what is? Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, that's a good question, Amir. And it's, co it's come up quite a bit also on, on my end. Um, I'm going to go again, uh, go back to the, the first, uh, this gas turbine engine that we designed. This was the first commercially available miniature gas turbine engine that was ever created that was available you know, to the average consumer, right? At the time, the solution that I saw to be very simple um, that allowed that engine to actually work, we never patented. So what we ended up doing was we put all this time and money in developing this company only to have people go out and immediately they would buy our engine, they would reverse engineer it. And before we knew it, we had over a dozen competitors you know, that made keeping and running this business very difficult. So when I started Alpha Dan, the first thing I said was, if we don't have intellectual properties, I'm not moving forward with this, no matter how great the idea is, okay? So the first thing that we did was we, we created um, a patent for the two-cylinder engine that we talk about, that 30-horsepower engine. And then the, uh, the patent where we were basically incorporating the Scotch yoke into the inline four-cylinder engine as a way of mitigating the secondary imbalance, okay? At that time, that, that's where our thought process was, okay? We then quickly realized from the feasibility study, from the in-depth second feasibility study that we did with Mala, that that was not the answer. There was a lot of problems associated with that design. And then it continued to evolve into um, two patents that we have right now that are patent pending. Now, one thing that a lot of people may or may not understand about patents, and I'm not an expert on patents either, but there's a couple of things that I can tell you. When you're patent pending, the first thing the attorney says is do not divulge any of this information to anybody because if the information gets out there, it becomes prior art. It basically prohibits you from being able to file international patents in some countries. And again, I'm giving you some very broad information. I'm not a patent attorney by any stretch of the imagination, but you have to protect those intellectual properties, not just for the, um, the IP process, but also for the IP protection of the company. You know, we have to keep an element of some sort of element of surprise, you know, for the day that we launch. So our ultimate goal is to be able to say, hey, if we get the patent on a given date, you know, if we do it right, we would, I would like to be launching the following day to the general public, okay? Another thing that it does that people don't realize, the cost of these patents is very expensive. And once you've got your final patent or your final IP, you've got a certain amount of time to file international patents. And the cost of doing that is expensive. So right now, our priority is to take the money that we receive from our investors and put it where it, it, it means the most for our company, which is the development of the engine. So if we can kick the can down the road on the patents and the international filings until we absolutely have to do it, then that's what we're doing. Okay, so a few people have also been asking for you to uh, publicly show the reports from Mala, which you have been with, with which you have been working closely on the development uh, of the engine. So, what can you tell us about that? Okay, first let me ask you a simple question: When you go and you invest in Tesla, 
Does Tesla, for example, I'm just going to use it as an example, okay, because I know a little bit about that, that car and the design. You know, does, does Elon Musk go out there and plaster all over the internet, you know, every blueprint and every design of exactly how they build their electric motor, how they build their speed controller, you know, the, the circuitry, the algorithms? The answer to that is no. They come out, they say, we're introducing this new car. It goes zero to 60 in 1.9 seconds. You know, here's our, our range and wait for it, okay? So, you know, at the end of the day, you have to be able to have something that you keep in-house. But, but because of the process that we have here in the United States, to be able to qualify for the Reg A Plus offering that we're doing, there's, we do have to divulge as much information as possible. So on our filing, there is the statement of work from Mala Powertrain. And that statement of work describes the three-year contract from the beginning all the way to the end, okay? You know, and I've had comments to say, well, that, doesn't, that does not validate your relationship with Mala. Well, there's a contract that was signed between Alpha Dan and Mala that uses that statement of work as an exhibit for that contract. The cost of that contract was six million, I think, four ninety nine five oh three. So approximately six and a half million dollars is the cost of of, of uh, executing that statement of work. Okay, and recently, um, the head guy in charge of Mala from our project actually responded in form of an email to one of these doubters, basically verifying the fact that we are currently, you know, we did a feasibility study prior to doing anything with Mala. The results of that study showed that the engine was feasible and there was, a, there was a very, very, very high percentage that the engine would work. That then drove us into this contract, which the first part of this contract, which, is, which we have it under risk mitigation, was to then fine tune that feasibility study. And we're, what we're doing in there is we're looking at things like, you know, what's the optimum bore and stroke ratio um, for combustion, uh, for the mean piston speed, which you want to keep it down below 25 meters per second, well below that. So uh, you're looking at the peripheral speed of the bearings, you're looking at, at, you know, your oil film thicknesses, you're looking at performance, airflow, all of these things are part of that feasibility study that fine tune the engine, okay, and then allow you to get into the next phase of the program. So right now we're 12 months into that contract, Mala has been paid in full to date, and, we've, and all payments have made ahead of schedule. Which brings up, you know, a lot of people say, what did you do with the money from your, your first round of funding? Well, we're a third of the way into this contract and we have 24 months to go. Another really common question was about um, electricity. A lot of people say, have been saying how the internal combustion engine is dead and how investing now in the internal combustion engine is a waste of money. So, so any, any comments on that? That could not be farther from the truth. Okay, and if you look at, you know, let's just look at simple math to answer that question. A typical 300 horsepower outboard engine on a 25 foot center console is going to have an 80 to 100 gallon fuel tank. And we're going to use 100 gallons for, for the simplicity of the math. Okay, so you go back and you look at, you know, how many watts of power it takes to make a horsepower, which is around 746. I think it's 745.7, but let's just use 746 as a round number, right? If you multiply that times 300 horsepower, you're looking at 223 kilowatts for one hour of power in a performance planing hull. Now, 100 gallons of fuel equates to four hours at wide open throttle, approximately, depending on the hull, okay, that you get out of that fuel tank that weighs approximately 600 pounds, okay? In order for you to, to equate that in batteries, you need close to 900,000 to one megawatt of power which based on today's battery density is about 20, 20 to 25,000 pounds. So even if, you know, battery density technology, you know, was cut in half and in half and in half again, you still wouldn't have a source of energy that could deliver what a gallon of fuel can, you know, on any one of these engines. So now imagine that's 20 to 25,000 pounds for 300 horsepower. Now, when you start getting into these bigger boats where you see three, four, five, and even six engines on the back, multiply that 20 to 25,000 times those numbers and the boat would never, it would, it would sink. Okay. So, you know, high, high performance boats and high performance airplanes will not be using, you know, electric motors, you know, to, you know, you're not going to get an airplane traveling at 500 plus miles an hour with an electric motor right now that, that will have any range. And if you look at most of these, you know, these one man, uh, 
uh, drone type, you know, helicopters or whatever you want to call them. Look at the range, you know, 15 minute range, 10 minute range. It's because of the battery density. So internal combustion engines are here to stay for decades, in my humble opinion, when it comes to high performance planing hulls, which is our market, and high performance aircraft. Now in cars, totally different story. You know, we, we have a Tesla Model S, and I could tell you, once you're on the highway, you know, you're using 20 to 25 kilowatts. So your 100 kilowatt battery gives you a four hour range. At 70 miles an hour, there's your, 20, your 280 miles that Tesla advertises. So electric power in automotive, it's the way of the future. Electric power in high performance boats and high performance airplanes is not gonna happen, at least not in my lifetime or yours. Another common question was, uh why boats? Why are you starting with the boat market? Isn't there bigger potential in cars or maybe motorcycles? What about planes? Okay, my passion, if you look at my background, started in aviation, it's still aviation and boating, okay? But here's the reality that most people don't understand. The amount of money and the amount of effort that it takes to start a company like this and to build a product like this is, is tenfold what anybody could imagine, okay? The marine industry, and specifically the high-performance marine industry, offers our company the best possible chance of success. And my responsibility now, and this is the first time that I've ever been part of a public company, so I'm still, I'm still learning you know, a lot of the, the, the rules and regulations, but the number one responsibility that I have as a CEO of AlphaDan is to our investors to protect their investment and to, you know, to reduce or minimize the risk as much as possible and increase you know, the chances of AlphaDan being successful and making money. Because at the end of the day, you know, we're in business to make money, okay? Second of all, this is something that I'm passionate about. And passion drives success, okay? So if you do something just for a job and money, you know, your chances of success, in my opinion, are cut 50%. So I'm very passionate about this. But the marine industry, the, the AlphaDan I-4 design gives us a huge advantage over the competition in an industry that has extremely, extremely low barriers of entry. Our profit margins are high, therefore our success rate or our chances of success are extremely high. Now, we did look at the automotive industry. To get into the automotive industry, per mala, they told me, Albert, you're nowhere, nowhere near a position to get into that industry right now. You need to have an engine that's proven, which it will be proven hopefully in the marine industry. And then at that point, we would be completely open to talking to you know, car companies or engine manufacturing companies. And the, the path for Alpha then at that point would probably be to um, you know, enter into some sort of a licensing agreement where we license the technology and we let those companies deal with you know, all of the EPA requirements and requirements and all of the, you know, the regulations that apply to that industry. If we try to, um, you know, if we don't focus on what we're doing, you get nowhere. So now let's go to your, the second part of your question, which was aviation. That's my passion. And I can tell you that the Alpha Dan engine, you know, if it's successful, which we highly, we believe it will be, okay, falls into what I'm calling a hybrid part of that industry. Because when you look at, at, at for example, like an IO540 or a, a horizontally opposed, you know, six or eight cylinder aircraft engine, those engines are normally in the lower horsepower category. And then you jump over to the Pratt & Whitney PT6, which is probably one of the most reliable um, turboprop engines on the market. Those engines, you know, you can get them, I think, anywhere from about 800 to, to over 1,000 horsepower, okay? But those engines are over a million dollars, okay? Alpha Dan, the Alpha Dan design kind of fits in the middle of all that. We can deliver a supercharged version of our engine that puts out the power of a Pratt & Whitney PT6 at a fraction of the cost, okay, in the middle, which means it's something that we would love, I would love to get into that. But the reality of it is that the volume of sales in the marine industry is tenfold, 20-fold what it is in the aviation industry. And the cost of getting into the aviation industry and building an FAA-certified aircraft engine is in the hundreds, hundreds of millions of dollars. So... We're struggling to, you know, to find investors to help us build this company. So trying to get into the car market or into the automotive, I mean, the aviation market is, is basically a pipe dream. It's not going to happen. 
and it's going to basically put our company in a path for failure. Okay, so so you've been mentioning Male a lot and and how you've been working closely together. So can you tell me a bit more about that relationship and exactly what does Male bring to the table? Okay, Amir, my my best way of expl- of kind of a kind of setting an example of Male to Alpha Dan is SpaceX to NASA. There's no question in anybody's mind that SpaceX has billions of dollars, you know, um available to them for research. They've got obviously a team of exceptional engineers. They've been able to accomplish things that NASA didn't, you know, never accomplished. But why did they partner up with NASA? Because NASA has decades of data and expertise in taking, you know, human beings and souls and putting them in a rocket and putting them in outer space. Okay? So SpaceX was intelligent enough to say, you know what? Although we're a great company and we have great resources, you know, we need to bring in somebody that really knows what we're doing in order to minimize risk. It's all it's all about you're you're minimizing risk for your investors and you're trying to maximize, you know, your chances of success as a company. So, first of all, I I met the guys at Mala through the guys over at Koenigsegg. I I met the 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 Skunk Work team over at 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 Koenigsegg you know, through the, the free valve pro, uh, process, which to me was a very interesting interesting program. And we are involved with them and, and we want to keep up with the development of that. Okay, but they they did a preliminary study on our engine and then they, they turned me over to the team that they use over at Mala, which has turned out to be the best thing that we could have ever done. First and foremost, the guys over there at Mala, the engineers, the managers, everybody over there, I couldn't say enough good things about them. The company as a whole is a phenomenal co- company, the, the, one of the best companies I've ever worked with. And the resources that they bring to AlphaDan completely changes the game from, from an investor's risk perspective and from the perspective of you know, our company being successful. I have learned more in the, in the year that we've been under contract developing this engine from you know, m- working with Mala on a weekly basis than I learned in the 25 years before. Okay, I've learned that the resources that they have, we could never match. You know, if you look at Mala, for example, when they when they manufacture pistons for the automotive industry, and one thing that people don't, a lot of people don't know, they they are the the um, the manufacturer, the designer of, of parts and engines for most of the the worldwide OEM companies. Okay, and I'm going to use a piston as an example. Anybody who knows about machining knows that holding tolerances in the in the tents is difficult. Okay, the automotive industry came to Mala, I don't know how many years ago, and said, we want tolerances that are zero. Therefore, we can take a piston anywhere in the world, we can put it in one of our engines, and we don't have to worry about the results of stacking tolerances in your favor or against your favor. So all of these parts at Mala are manufactured under what a regular machinist would say zero tolerance policy, and they're measured in microns. So what that does is it, 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 it assures Alpha then that the powerhead, the I-4 of the outboard engine project that we are developing is as close to perfect as humanly possible and being manufactured, designed, engineered, and scrutinized down to the last detail by a company that's been in business for over 100 years, has access to thousands of internal combustion engine, you know, engineers and designers and, and software and hardware that we could never ever reproduce. Not to mention the cost of even trying to duplicate that would put us right back in the same position as if we were trying to build an aircraft engine. Another unrealistic pipe dream. So they bring to the table a, a, a team that we could never match and a relationship that right now, I mean, I couldn't say enough good things about, about our team at Mala. So you've been mentioning also uh, prototypes. So can you tell us a bit about the prototypes of the Alphadine engine? Okay, here is, here is, you know, let's clarify a couple of things. The, the, the first prototype was not developed by Mala, okay? We received a grant from the National Science Foundation to develop, and uh, basically it was a high-speed um, two-cylinder opposed engine that we were, you know, originally the idea was to build a high-speed, you know, small generator that was, you know, much smaller than, than using a, a big diesel engine or anything like that. I've got the engine here, I'm going to show it to you because there's a lot, of, a lot of people say, if you've got it, why don't you show it? I don't know if you can see it. This engine right here mm-hmm. was the engine that, that we developed through that program, okay? It's a two-cylinder uh, 
engine. It's 124 cc's. And then that, that uh, developed, and I've got, I can, get, I can show you a stack of, of parts. You know, full, my shop is full of, you know, larger cylinders. Um, we got, you know, crankcase halves, crankshafts. Um, let me see what else we got here. We got the, uh, you know, the first, the first uh, sleeve, the second sleeve. You know, this, this goes on and on and on. Okay, so okay. the purpose of that engine was to, you know, to, we were looking for a market through this, um, this, this NSF grant, okay? And once that was completed, that engine was the, I'm going to say the, uh, the, the, the uh, test engine to start uh, implementing some of the ideas that were going to go into the inline four-cylinder engine. Uh, we were testing different type of, of uh, bearing materials. One of the materials that I happen to love a lot is silicon nitride. I think it's a great material. It's how we solved the bearing problem in our miniature turbines back in, in the 1990s. So that engine allowed us to test materials that could potentially work in the I-4. Now, I've got a short video. You know, the day that I ran that engine, I started in the morning and I, never, I, didn't, I didn't get it to fire off till late at night. So by the time it finally lit off, I was tired, it was late, it was dark, and I got a 15, 30 second video on my iPhone that the quality is, is as terrible as it gets. So to me to put that up, you know, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't something that I wanted to do. But um, at the end of the day, using that, that engine as a prop, you know, and I call it a Hollywood theatrical prop, to lure investors into investing in this project would be outright deceptive because that is not a representation of what this engine is, okay? So now you go on to the second part of that prototype, okay? The first thing that I wanted to do, which is what everybody wants to do, is I wanted to go out and buy a 200 horsepower, you know, two point something liter I-4, build the block out of billet, build the rods that we believed was, you know, the answer to this problem, and then build this engine and run it. Again, that, that process, I could tell you today, like I'm having this conversation with you, that process had a one, not a hundred, a one million percent chance of failure, knowing what I know today, okay? So what would have happened with that? We would have blown, we would have spent, the, the million dollars that we raised in, in our Reg CF, would have been spent chasing ourselves into a, into a perpetual loop of R&D. You go back and you look um, at the engines that are on the internet. You look at the tiny yet mighty. Um, you look at a lot of these uh, rotary wankel engines. You look at most of these concept engines and look at the history of the development. They've been doing it for, you know, some of the guys are young when they start and then you look at them today and they've got gray hair and beards. They've aged 20 years and they still, they still have the same engine and they're still going in the same circle. Because what they're doing is what, what I did. You know, you sit in front of a computer with SolidWorks or Pro-E, you design this engine, you look at the stacking of the tolerances, you go to a machine shop that doesn't want to do anything for you because it's low volume and it's expensive to set up and run, you know, one or two or ten parts. And then you get those parts, you build it, you run it, you test it, it fails. You go back to the drawing board and you keep, you keep doing that over and over again until you get to a point 15 years down the road where you're like, listen, I either got to launch with what I have or I got to pull the plug on this thing. And nine out of 10 times you launch a, a faulty product that takes you down. So what we did, and it goes back to our relationship with Mala, was it took a lot for Mala to convince me to do this. But the prototype process that we are following, I don't even consider it a prototype. The feasibility study under contract, not the first one, the one under contract, fine tunes the design. We reduced the bore to get the efficiency and the EPA to, and to meet the EPA requirements. We reduced the RPM to reduce the mean piston speed. We reduced bearing diameters to reduce the peripheral speed of the bearings and maintain you know, proper you know, oil, oil film thickness. Okay? Once we have all those parameters fine-tuned, they then ran the engine, a simulation, where they, they basically collect the data. No, now they have the piston design, the rod design, everything is designed, the crank, everything's designed. And they basically, they take, they collect data every one degree over the 720 degrees of the four stroke cycle. That allows them to identify the loads 
on every single part at every degree of rotation during that full cycle. And that's where we discovered the problems with the initial design that led to our current design. By doing that, you're, you're mitigating risk as much as humanly possible. So once you've refined the design, once you've refined the parts, once you've gone through all of the software, you know, analytics or testing or whatever you want to call it, and you come up with your final, final, this is it, we then are in the phase that we're in right now, building a test rig to take those parts individually and physically test them to compare the structural integrity of that part to the software and the engineering. And then we say, okay, so now let's take that part to failure. And let's see if this part shows us that it has a fail, you know, 200, 300, 400% more than we need, then we can reduce the amount of material on that part, further reducing the reciprocating mass, further reducing the loads on the bearings and on the engine, and you continue to fine tune the design, okay? We then also have a, it's called a tribology test, which tests the individual bearings for oil film thickness, you know, under different temperature conditions and different loads and all kinds of things that I'm not an expert on, okay? These are the things that, that, that Mala does that I, I was not aware of, okay? So once all of that is completed, all of that is done, and you've gotten your design nailed down to, to the last, you know, tenth of a, of a percentage, and you've got all your parts perfected, we build a single cylinder engine, which we do not have to date. It's not part of the prototype pro program, you know, right now, excuse me, not part of the existing prototypes. It's what Mala considers the first engine run. And, and here's how I try to explain it in as simple as possible. If you have $2 million you know, allocated to the testing of your engine, and we build an I-4, four cylinders, you know, 16 valves, and the full engine, every time we're going to do anything to try and modify that design, because the purpose of running the engine is not to see if it runs, it's to tweak the design. It's to tweak the intake manifold, the exhaust manifold, you know, try different combustion chamber designs, you know, valve angles, valve timing, duration, you know, everything that goes along with it. They also analyze the oil coming off of that engine to see if, you know, to, to predict future um, failures, okay? So that process, if you use an inline four, you're diluting your $2 million into four cylinders, therefore allocating $500,000 per cylinder. By, by taking that and doing a single cylinder of the actual engine that will be going into production, all $2 million are put into that single cylinder. So you just, you just put yourself in a position where you can allocate four times more human and financial resources to perfecting the engine. Because whatever happens in one cylinder is going to happen in all four. Now, Mala, Mala explained to me when they, and they, trust me, it took them two months to convince me to do this. Don't, you know, don't get me wrong. I was on the same path as everybody else. But they told me, Albert, ever since or any time that we've used this process with an OEM, when we go from that single cylinder to the multi-cylinder, be it an inline six, a V6, a V8, a V12, you're just multiplying the data that you got from that single cylinder you know, running engine, and we have never, ever had a failure when we've gone from that process to the multi-cylinder. When you see the very first big block Alpha Dan I-4, that engine is pretty much a production-ready engine that could be bolted onto our outboard, okay? And, and another big part about this whole thing is this is not just about developing the big block I-4. We're developing an outboard you know, the, the, the I-4 is the powerhead to this project. We've got a midsection. We've got, you know, gears that we have to shift. We have a lower unit that has to absorb all that horsepower and put it into a propeller. There's power steering. There's trim and tilt. There's helm controls. There's a cowling design. There's the intake design, you know, that, that separates the, the salt water, you know, or the fresh water from your intake air and muffles the noise coming from the intake. So all of those things are part of the process. And to build an I-4 that is nothing more than a, than I call it a theatrical Hollywood prop that I know is going to fail because we didn't follow this process 
is in my opinion deceptive, okay? And nothing more than a way of luring investors into a business, you know, by using something that's not accurate. So I would rather take the heat, you know, on the internet, but we are staying the course, 100%. Okay, so uh, for our final question, can you tell us a bit about the time frame? When when can we expect to see the Alpha Nine engine? Okay, if I was an investor, that would be probably one of the first questions that I'd ask, because I want to know, you know, if I'm going to invest in this company, you know, what are what are the chances of of you know, me seeing a return on this? Okay, if you go back and you ask that question to most of those other companies out there building engines, there's no time frame in sight. Okay, you know, why? Because you look at some of these companies, they say, oh, we're building this, this great engine and we can use it in a lawnmower, we can use it in a car, in a boat, in an airplane, in a helicopter, in a weed eater, in a drone, in a model airplane. There's all these potential markets, okay? But there's no focus. There's no focus on saying, we're gonna build one engine to bring it to one market and here's how we're gonna make money. So what we've done at AlphaDan is we've concentrated on one engine, one product, one horsepower, one market with a definite note. We've got a time frame of when we want to release this engine. Okay. Right now we've got two years left on the Moloch contract. Before we get to the end of that, we are actually, we have an engine that we're putting, you know, or actually not one engine, we'll have about four to six engines that we're putting on the back of boats for testing. And then we've got about a six month buffer window built in there before our launch date, which is set to be the first quarter of 2024. And there's a reason for that. Um, it's one of the, the largest boat shows here in the United States. It's the Miami International Boat Show. So that is our launch date for now. And again, this is a very ambitious project and an ambitious um, schedule. But that's the reason why we chose to team up you know, with industry leaders that are ISO certified. You know, and part of that certification process is you have a schedule, you need to keep it. You know, we have meetings regularly where we look at where are we on the schedule. And if, you know, at, at, for example, at one point in time, we were running about a month behind schedule. And the reason why was because we took some of the work that we were supposed to be doing two thirds of the way in the contract and we moved it forward to the, to the first phase. So we're moving, um, you know, this is a, this is a you know, it's, it's a moving target. We're moving pieces from the schedule you know, forward to try and, 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 and mitigate risk as much as possible at the beginning, you know, but always staying focused on the completion date and the launch date. So I think that should pretty much address that question. Okay, Mr. Rojo, thank you very much for answering all of our questions today. Okay, no, thank you. And uh, feel free to contact me if, uh, if you have any other questions. Awesome, awesome. So that's gonna be pretty much it for, for, today's, uh, for today's interview video. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I hope we managed to answer all the questions from the comment section of our first video. Uh, as always, thanks a lot for watching. I'll be seeing you soon with more fun and useful stuff on the D4A channel.